It is August 23rd, 2020. This is Rook. He is the kid from Shiraz who ascended to the heights of the most American of institutions. Firuz Naderi is well known for his rise to the top levels of NASA and his brilliant work in bringing humanity closer to Mars. But on top of a new Mars mission just launched, Dr. Naderi is also increasingly speaking out about the world, politics and policy in the United States and in Iran, and feeling the sting of those who disagree with him as a consequence. Today, a very special interview with Firuz Naderi about space, belonging, and backlash. This is Conversations from to and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there. Welcome to episode number 35. Number 35 <laughs> of Rook. Salam Azizan, Salam Dustan. I'm uh, going to be joined in a few moments from now by Firuz Naderi uh, in Los Angeles. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. Uh, the Rook on Air Thursday posse are all here. Groovy Shaya, the Minister of Creativity. <laughs> Hello, Khubi. Hello, yes, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm well. Captain Reza, the studio director of our program. How goes the, the ship? <laughs> Hello, sir. How are you? I'm, 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 well, I asked you a question. How goes the ship? I guess it, it goes, it goes pretty like well. A, no, no. All right. Everything is in order. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the dials are all in order. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, we got a real life space guy coming on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, that's scary. So your dials are. That's right. Maybe juvenile in comparison. And that's the voice of the <laughs> fabulous Keon, the Lieutenant of Letters. I was waiting for my title. <laughs> Hello, Keon. I'm gonna fight for that captain <laughs> position one day, Reza. <laughs> how are you? How uh, how's your week been? I, I I know you've been going to the gym, dude. I have been killing myself at the gym. I had to tie my shoes on my back the other day because I couldn't bend over. Do you know why I know you've been going to the gym? <laughs> well, I don't know. How have you known? Yeah, take a guess. Because there's spying on me. No, because you constantly put pictures of yourself at the gym. I do not. You're Instagram. making me sound like... And, <laughs> and I just wonder, when you go to the gym, do you not think of like oh, that you should focus on working out? Because uh, it seems like most of what you're doing there. I mean, there's a series of videos and photos. It's and just... Okay, Gian, you're <laughs> exaggerating now. It's just my story. I'll just make it very clear to everybody. I am at the gym. Do not right. message me. Do not call me. Don't talk to me. Is that really why? Yeah, so everyone knows where kind you are. Of, yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, in the mornings. Mornings are my gym time. The quarantine 15 got me hard and I am like, I am on my way Good back. for you. Yeah, I'm yeah. actually really impressed with how my, I'm still scared to go. We go to the why? same gym and I haven't gone yet. It's actually better now because it's everybody gets an hour limit and there's I a know, capacity you're still you get touching so things you're aren't you i don't know i don't they, know they clean I they clean it pretty yeah. thoroughly yeah. i want to support the gym but i i don't i still don't feel comfortable is that yet. your excuse Gian? <laughs> oh, you excuse. Know, it's it's right, exactly <laughs> hey listen a very special mention to our honorary rook team member this week mo rahimian mo rahimian and his company in shufin who are experts in financial planning, life, health, and securing wealth in insurance. His company also does travel insurance for uh, clients around the world. So no matter where you are listening to this from, you can deal with Mo and Inshufin for your travel insurance requirements. Probably not a bad idea to take out insurance in the time of COVID if you're <laughs> traveling. He calls himself uh, a Canadian Iranian. He says, I love and respect Canada. It's my country, but I'm also a proud Iranian. 
Uh, and as I was saying on our Monday show, Mo takes profits from his company and puts them back into the Iranian community, supporting arts, culture, events. And as such, today's Rook episode is made possible with the help of Inshufin. So a big thanks to Mo Rahimian for all you do for the uh, Iranian community. Uh, the Iranian diaspora. We uh, we got a bunch of mail as well about the Navid Negahban episode on Monday and the karate champion Nassim Varaste, who was on our show last week. Don't believe she takes pictures of herself while she's doing karate. <laughs> she spends that time doing the karate. <laughs> well, that, the that's the fact that, that she's a champion. <laughs> We're going to get to our letters, uh, <laughs> Navid Negapon, Nassim Varaster, and all uh, and some interesting conversations that came out of those conversations. We will get to that in a little while, yes? Yes. Okay. Yes, we will. Thank you, Keon, Reza, Shia. Let me get to our guest who is standing by. You know, our special guest today actually needs a little introduction, especially for Americans and people of Iranian descent around the world. He has spent recent decades managing NASA programs in pursuit of a most fundamental question. Are we alone in the universe. Dr. Firuz Nadiri was born in Iran's city of poets, Shiraz. He completed his elementary education in his hometown, then moved to Tehran for his secondary education. He immigrated to the United States after graduating from high school in the 1970s. Firuz received his doctorate from the University of Southern California in electrical engineering and joined NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 1979 and went on to lead the that unit as its director until 2016. On his retirement, NASA actually named an asteroid, Nadari 5515, in his honor. Firuz referred to the asteroid and said, fortunately, it will never hit the Earth. Dr. Nadari is now cooperating as a counselor with NASA, as well as startup programs. He's also working as an instructor of the Prospective Leaders Training Center for the Iranian American Association. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and the recipient of a number of awards, including NASA's Outstanding Leadership Medal, the Space Technology Hall of Fame Medal, and NASA's highest award, the Distinguished Service Medal. He's also a 2005 recipient of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, given for outstanding contributions that have enriched American society and exemplify its cultural diversity. He was most recently recognized by the American Astronautical Society with the William Randolph Lovelace II Award for Outstanding Contributions to Space science and technology and right now dr finus nadari joins me from los angeles today hello sir hello john thanks for that introduction it's hard to live up to all that you said but uh thank you for your uh generous uh introduction Firuz, it's a great honor to have you on this program, truly, and I hope you've been staying uh safe and uh, healthy during this weird pandemic time for the world well there is no other option as you know uh uh, it's uh, like everybody else. Uh, we've been uh, quarantined or just uh, socializing with a select number of families and hoping that this will pass. You know, I wanted to start with the fact that it's it's somewhat fortuitous timing to have you on this program because just last week, Mars 2020, or a couple of weeks ago, was launched, the Perseverance. And before we get into the details of it, I, I, I'm thinking of you and I'm thinking of how you've worked on these projects for years. And I wonder if you're like a kid at Christmas or, or Noruz with the ADs when there's a new Mars mission. Is it still exciting for you? Yes, John. I mean, you can't help it. Yeah, you know, I've spent uh, most of my career in space science uh, and been involved in the uh, NASA Mars mission in the past two decades. Um, so yes, I still get a thrill uh, every time. Uh, every time we launch, and uh, I've been uh, personally, one way or the other, been involved in uh, NASA Mars missions uh, since 2000 when I helped uh, replan it, and uh, so I have some personal stakes. Um, and uh, I yes, I, I follow it uh, religiously. I guess there's also, I remember when you started with the Mars missions, there had been a couple of failed missions in the late 90s. So there's always, uh, you can never be 100% comfortable or sure that everything's going to go correctly, right? 
Yeah, I mean, to give you an indication, this is sort of a um, tongue-in-cheek. Uh, you know, if this was a, um, a soccer or a football match between Earth and Mars, Mars so far has had the better of it. You know, we have, we people of Earth, have sent things to Mars some um, uh, 56 uh, times. And of the 56 times, we've been successful 26 and uh, not so 30 times. So score is 26 to 30 in favor of Mars. But and now with the uh, missions that you mentioned, uh, with the uh, three countries, uh, uh, Iran, China, and United uh, Emirates, uh, there are six, um, between the three of them, they're sending six robots that if they are all successful, and we would know that, uh, you know, sometimes in mid-February uh, when they reach Mars, uh, for the first time, <laughs> Earth will have the uh, upper hand uh, with uh, 32 to 30. But, yeah, it is difficult. Um, landing particularly so, uh, but uh, it is not routine uh, even after all these decades. As a long-suffering Arsenal fan, I can identify with those statistics. <laughs> I, I'm going to try and do this in a way that's uh, accessible. I, you're great at, when you're talking about science. I've seen you in interviews and speeches, and, and you're very accessible in the way you do it. And that helps me because I'm not a scientist, and I don't understand all the details. But I do understand that Perseverance is the first mission, this new one, that plans to bring samples of Mars back to Earth. Is that right? And this is, this is the yes, ongoing... Yeah, no, no, you, you, you you are correct. Um, so every time we have gone to Mars, we have never come back. Uh, neither we have sent things back or any other robots have come back. So it's always been uh, one way. So if you really want to dig in and try to find out whether there ever was life on Mars um, uh, of any sort, uh, there is really no other way but to bring samples of Mars back and then expose them to the and work on them uh, with the most sophisticated instruments in the world right now in the laboratories. So for this reason, bringing samples back has been always a holy grail of Mars exploration, but uh, the technology wasn't quite right. Uh, in fact, uh, at one time it was uh, scheduled for 2008, but when I became the uh, program manager for Mars, I uh, advocated for canceling it because I didn't think it would be successful. But now we're there. So um, as you mentioned, uh, this is first of three consecutive missions. So the first mission, which is what we sent, is going to hopefully land safely on Mars. And it is going to land in a ancient lake bed, right. uh, um, a crater called Jezero. And also there is an ancient river that uh, in billions of years ago uh, emptied into this lake. And as you may know, when rivers empty uh, into a lake, they, at the mouth, they sort of fan out in something called the river delta. And uh, things that they've been carrying, uh, it sort of gets uh, deposited at that delta. So uh, we are trying to reach that delta, land there, and we are taking about 40 test tubes with us. Um, and what we'll do, we'll core into that delta, we'll take samples out and fill these test tubes, 40 of them, from uh, a, uh, a varied uh, locations. And then... Um, and uh, with the instrumentations that we have on board, we make sure that we uh, take the best possible samples. Uh, we first examine them and, uh, you know, and then fill the uh, test tubes. And then we just leave them there. We just leave it uh, strewn around the, um, the, the land on Mars. So the second of the third mission, which we will send in about four or five years, for the first time it will send a actual rocket which will lift off the surface of Mars for the first time ever. And we land that on Mars. And since we cannot exactly put it where Perseverance left the test tubes, there is a little rover that goes and will fetch uh, these 40 samples and bring it back to the rocket. There, we will put them inside a tube since we're uh, staying with sports analogy, the, the size of the... Uh, 
The ball is uh, about a soccer ball. We put all 40 tubes inside the, uh, that soccer ball size uh, sphere. We put it on top of the rocket and we shoot it off uh, from the surface of Mars mm. into orbit around Mars. So there is now this shiny, bright soccer ball uh, with all the samples inside of it uh, circling Mars. And, and let, me get, let, me, let me guess, the third mission is to go and pick up those samples from, the, from space then. You keep that up, and I'm going to sign you up. Uh, <laughs> so, Deduction. Yes, <laughs> indeed, that's the, the uh, third mission. That one will not be done by America. Uh, it will be done by ESA, which is European Space Agency, uh, which is uh, representing a consortium of uh, countries in Europe. It will go to orbit of Mars, and in that vast emptiness tries to locate this soccer ball, and rendezvous with it, capture it, cocoon it in something to make sure if um, there is any microbe on Mars, it will not expose Earth with it, and then bring it back to Earth, and um, there the real work starts of uh, starting to examining the samples. Okay, so the pretext of this, the great goal of this, is is assessing whether there is or has been life on Mars. The great question, and. And I want to ask you a question now that that is either extremely naive or profound. I'm not sure which you can decide, and and, and perhaps it's absurd. But given that it has long been the aspiration of humankind to to learn what kind of life might be out there in the cosmos or on Mars, and I know I know you've long been a student of this. What will we gain by finding an answer to that age old question? Are we alone in the universe or not? Well, look. Uh the in the vastness of the universe uh, and to just give you a quick sense of uh, how large the universe is uh you um, are in toronto if you go to the nearest lake or nearest beach and try to pick a sand grain a single sand grain out of all the sand grains in the lake that is um l- let's call that our sun and uh, and then continue counting all the sand grains in the local beaches, and then when you're done, uh, everything in so- South America, North America, Europe, in fact, count all the sand grains <laughs> on the beaches on Earth. Okay. And the number of stars, stars being other entities like our sun, is more than all the sand grains in the world. It would seem... Uh, one way or the other, either we are so uh, blessed uh, among all these sand grains that we uh, alone uh, uh, developed uh, life uh, here on planet Earth around the sun, or in fact you can use the argument that that would be uh, uh, rather um, arrogant of us to even think that, right. that there are many, many more life forms. At any, at any rate, it gives you a context for us being here on Earth. I think that's profound, knowing whether, in fact, we are alone in, in the universe or not. And even though this is not the subject of this discussion because it takes a long time, so I will avoid it, uh, if you look at how life first arose on Earth uh, since it was formed four and a half billion years ago, and how that happened, which is uh, uh, the probability is very, very low, but it did. If you find out, not in any other sand grain, but in our own little sand grain, in our solar system, there was a second place, like Mars, that independent of Earth also developed life, then the probability that the universe is teeming with life would be exponential. So that is one of the reasons we go to Mars. Mm -hmm. But generally, Gian, I I think our young people are always inspired and seek to go into math and computer science and technology, uh, you know, when there is uh, something inspirational, and you can't deny that space exploration is uh, is, uh, inspirational. Um, And uh, 
throughout the years, uh, our technology that we use in everyday life, in uh, medicine, uh, in uh, um, assembly of uh, uh, machines and things like that, in GPS, they have all been helped by the fact that we have developed these technologies uh, for space, and years later it has sort of found its way into the normal life. So the people who say, well, what does it mean to me? Even if the philosophical question that we just talked about doesn't get you, uh, then uh, you would give it a nod because it actually helps your life here on Earth. Let me come back to that because that's a that in terms of funding, that's a big question too. But uh, first of all, by the way, just parenthetically, I, uh, listening to you, you're so into this. I, I, I mean, and to continue our sports analogies, <laughs> I know you're technically retired from NASA, but but you're kind of like Michael Jordan. You you retire, but then you come back. I mean, Peter's not there. Now he seems to have never really left NASA and. And space exploration never really leaves Firuz. Would that be correct? Yeah, it goes in uh, your blood. Uh, first of all, you know, I have uh, stepped down from my full-time duty at NASA. <laughs> I have not retired. You can't just turn the switch off and retire. So I'm still pretty active, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, in consulting in uh, back to NASA and also with early-stage startups. So I'm still fairly active, and uh, uh, and yes, uh, yeah, it's uh, you're addicted to it. Why? It's never what? Been. What is the? It, can you put it into words? What's the drug that is uh, space exploration for you? Um, you know, I coach uh, a number of uh, young uh, Iranian students, um, actually uh, international, not only Iranian, um, that. Uh, they always ask me, you know, we want to follow in your footsteps and, you know, what propelled you ahead. There is only one thing I can think of over and above everything else, and that is curiosity. I think that is what drives us, the, uh, the yearning to know what's around the bend, to go around the corner and see what's around the bend. I think that propels um, everybody. And uh, so what uh, keeps me engaged is that there is so much to know. And I'm, you know, I've been, I'm so naturally curious uh, that uh, you always try to stay um, up to date. And that's what drives you. Hmm. It's interesting that you should use the word curiosity. Let, let me stick with the Mars missions for another couple of minutes. You were directly involved with the well-known Curiosity mission a rover that is currently on Mars. It's doing its job. And on the NASA science website, it says that the ultimate goal of the curiosity is human exploration of Mars. Uh, what would that look like? H how could it benefit us and, and the universe? What does human exploration on or of Mars look like? Well, uh, you know, go back to 50, uh, you know, 15th century, uh, Europe was doing well, Portugal was doing well, uh, the known universe was known to them. And uh, had they not been curious to try to find out what else is there, uh, you know, they would have never crossed the oceans and tried to go to America. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, you know, the rest is history. Um, so it is uh, within us, you know, it is part of our uh, human's DNA that wants to explore. And, uh, and it, through that exploration, as I explained earlier, uh, their uh, life uh, enriches. So uh, the idea of uh, trying to get further and further out in the universe uh, you know, stems from that. Now, there are some people who say, well, if you're going to Mars because you think someday Earth would be uninhabitable and, uh, you know, you're going to Mars so you can have a second beachhead, uh, and that's uh, um, foolhardy, why don't you take care of Earth? Why are you destroying Earth so that you need to go to some place else? That's never the argument. Of course we should take care of Earth first. Uh, that's the only life, uh, the only uh, home that we know. Mm. 
So Mars is not to be a substitute for Earth. So it is stems uh, first and foremost out of curiosity to push further into the uh, uh, universe. But, you know, if uh, we are foolish enough to someday uh, make uh, uh, Earth uninhabitable, then it would give us another option. Steve Hawking uh, said that uh, if within 1,000 years from now humans have not found another place uh, which they can call uh, in which, which they can live on aside from Earth, in that we will go extinct. Let me ask the question directly. We are sitting in the middle. I mean, you've touched on this a couple of times, but I want to give you the chance to really respond to it. We're sitting in the middle of a global pandemic where yeah. resources can be scarce, economies are tumbling. You know, at the height of the U.S.-Soviet space race, there there yeah. seemed to be this great appetite for spending when it came to space exploration. What is the case you would make today for uh, someone who says, why why is my nation putting sure. resources into a Mars mission versus health care or the environment? Sure. If you take a dollar of federal government and then take a penny, one hundredth of it, uh, out of that dollar, and then cut it in half, and then cut that in half, that's the budget of NASA. And so if you are, in fact, uh, hard up for uh, balancing the budget relative to other urgencies, I would submit to you that the war that America had with Iraq, what, 15, years, uh, 15 16 years ago, right. that would fund NASA for 70 years. So I think it would be misguided, given all the benefits that I cited, to go after that quarter of one penny, try to save money to fund Social Security or Medicare. Uh, there are other places where I think we are spending foolishly that if, in fact, you want to rebalance your priorities, that's where to look. Uh, <laughs> it is not to got NASA. You, you talked about what people get wrong in terms of the budget uh, when it comes to, to NASA. What, what are myths that people have about NASA? What do people get wrong about this institution? It depends. Uh, it, I mean, there are uh, conspiracy theorists abound. Uh, you know, there are people who think that we know a lot. We've been in contact with aliens, and uh, and uh, uh, we are hiding that from the public. Wait, and, that's and so not forth. true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let me clarify and and say no, that and okay. that is uh, right. not true. And the uh, second thing is that uh, you know we uh, faked the uh, moon landing. You know, we that was all done in Hollywood studios. And we faked it. And then no matter how many times you explain it to them, they still come back to it. So uh, there are conspiracy theories which I think do not want to learn. And uh, I have stopped uh, uh, wasting my breath uh, talking to them. <laughs> if you, I, I, I want to shift from space into identity, but just before I do that, if you could set a mission goal for exploration without any concern for budgetary requirements or political support? What would that goal be? Aside from uh, human travel, which uh, I think uh, to Mars, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, I mean, Elon Musk's uh, bravado notwithstanding, I mean, at one time he said, you know, we're going to go there in 2018, when yes. that was two years ago. Yes. Uh, then it's 2024. I don't think that's going to happen. I think sometimes between 20, 30, few years after that, um, that's a possibility. In fact, just before I left NASA, with the help of two colleagues, uh, we laid out a plan uh, to, in fact, enable uh, you know such a mission. And knowing, you know, just what you talked about about NASA budget, knowing that we can never go back to early uh, 60s with the Cold War and uh, you know, b budget was uh, no issue. We uh, said, what if NASA budget never grows beyond what it is right now, just grows with inflation? How long will it take and how would we uh, sequence things to go to Mars? And it turned out to be uh, mid-2030s. Now, uh, 
on uh, is a bit more ambitious, which I think is good. I think NASA is getting too conservative. I think it needs somebody uh, from the private sector to sort of push NASA. So I think SpaceX is really not in competition with NASA, but I think it is a nice compliment. Uh, they may bring it uh, forward a little bit, but it is not in the next few years will we'll, we'll go uh, eventually. So human to Mars is one. And the second one of my favorite is that we believe that if there is currently uh, any kind of biology elsewhere in our solar system, the probability is the highest for a moon of Jupiter. You know, Jupiter, uh, and like us that have only one moon, Jupiter has like 67, 68 moons. And one of them, Europa, so has a vast ocean which is cocooned inside uh, a shell of 20 or so kilometer ice. We believe that all the conditions for emergence of life uh, is there for Europa. And be able to find that out, I, I think, would be another great thing and probably was the last mission that I worked on before I left NASA. You were a kid from Shiraz who had a great facility for math and science, as the story goes. You came to America as a, as a young man in the late 70s. Uh, much of your story has been told elsewhere, and there is a great deal of, of pride in our diaspora that an Iranian has ascended to the celestial heights that you have. Let me ask a, a question this way. Is there anything about being from the East, growing up there, being Iranian, that you think helped your perspective on life and space as you were coming up in NASA? Yeah, no, not exactly the way you asked it. Um, uh, first of all, to clarify, and I uh, do not say with any uh, false sense of uh, uh, being humble, there are so many, particularly among the young generation of Iranian Americans that uh, that come here, or Iranian students that come here, that I see so much, so much smarter than I uh, that uh, I was, uh, you know, at their age, uh, is that, no, I was not particularly blessed, uh, you know, uh, being uh, uh, any more advanced than anybody else. Uh, so probably it was hard work, curiosity, and good luck that allowed me to get to where I am. Uh, so it is eminently possible for um, everybody else. And I think, in fact, uh, such a mistake for America and kudos to Canada that uh, has uh, kept the doors open for Iranian students coming <coughs> here to further their education. And one way or the other, you know, I, I said this thing uh, in an interview that it is a win-win for America. Either they come and, like myself, decide to stay in this country and get absorbed in this society, which, uh, which is good, or, in fact, they go back to their country with, a, with empathy for America and change the perception yes. of the home country about America. Yes. To close the doors on Iranian students, which get accepted uh, disproportionately at uh, you know, uh, universities like Stanford and MIT's and Caltech, it's just so short-sighted by the current administration and that uh, it just, uh, you know, frankly infuriates me. What about that, that notion of hard work that you talk about, though? And not to romanticize the notion of immigrants uh, being hardworking, et cetera, but do you think that there was an element to that, that you outworked uh, those around you because uh, of uh, coming from somewhere else and needing to work that much harder, uh, given the language tools and all the, and, and, uh, the pedagogical approach and having to adapt to everything in, in the States? No, I think the classical picture that we have of the immigrants that try harder um, uh, you know, it it's, uh, really is there. There, there is a, you may uh, know him, uh, Omide Kurdistani. He sure. was, yeah. um, uh, you know, the 10th employee at Google and now is the executive chairman at Twitter. He gave a commencement speech at, uh, at the university. And there's something that he said he stuck with me. You know, he came here as a 14-year-old with uh, his uh, single mom. And uh, he talked about how he got ahead 
given the mindset that you're talking about. Uh, and, you know, at the, at the beginning, you are not native, your English, if you're like in Canada or U.S., is not good enough, and uh, you um, come from a different culture, you have to adapt. All of that makes you work harder. So, but what he said that stuck with me was that he said that now, you know, years, 50 years later, now that I'm well assimilated in the American culture, one thing that I tell all immigrants, that after you succeed, don't lose the mindset of an immigrant. Keep that with you. Even though you don't face the same challenges as you did when you first came here. And that, you know, mindset that he talked about, uh, you know, uh, says everything. And do you have that mindset? I've always kept it. I think, yeah, I've always, uh, I'm very competitive uh, anyways, but uh, yes, I've kept that mindset. Tell me about, you know, on uh, leaping off that, uh, jumping off that very point. Tell me about being a guy who has worn the emblem of one might say the most American of institutions on your sleeve, NASA, but who also regularly and proudly identifies as Iranian. How do those two nations coexist in you? Ah, you know, I, I refer to that as the curse and the blessing of having two countries. Uh, so it, it, it is difficult. Uh, you know, I. You talked a little bit about my history, um, uh, my adult life, and I call my adult life beyond my high school years. And high school years, you know, I went to a a boarding in Catholic uh, high school in Tehran, and so I was sort of shielded from the society. So even when I left Iran at 18, I had not really grown up all that much uh, in the outside world of, uh, uh, you know, Iran society. But beyond that, uh, now I've spent 95% of my life in in America. Adult life. Adult life. Right. And uh, I feel uh, in a very strong uh, way that I owe a uh, sense of gratitude uh, to two countries, uh, one in which I was born and the other one which enabled the rest of my life. Uh, and I cannot differentiate. Uh, you know, when people say, well, you know, are you really an Iranian or an American? Mm. And uh, my response has always been, you know, once you break an egg into a bowl and then steer it, it is very hard to separate the uh, <laughs> the yolk from the white, right. and that is uh, most uh, pe- uh, people who have immigrated and have been here for a long time. So I, you know, have a sense of belonging to both. And when some people, as you know, maybe we'll get to talk about it, um, particularly in this uh, sensitive times in American history and election coming up, uh, they talk about you know, you need to vote this way or the other way. It's your duty to uh, Iran and forget about any sense of duty that you have uh, to America because, after all, you're Iranian. Uh, And I said, no, I'm not Iranian. I'm Iranian-American. The both go together. I have duties uh, and sense of loyalty to Iran and sense of loyalty to America. Uh, and uh, so I'm not going to choose. I mean, no matter how much you try to press me and shame, you know, fr- frankly, in uh, uh, social media, they try to shame you into taking sides yes. uh, between your two identities. Yes. And I just refuse to do it. Uh, those misguided people who insist, uh, let them live their lives. But uh, most of the people that I know here, they feel obligations to both countries. And there are times where there were people who were advocating that America should bomb Iran, uh, you know, to get rid of the current regime, which, by the way, uh, not to politicize your uh, show, I'm very much against. Uh, But I, you know, I was very much against it. Uh, You you know, you don't bomb a nation in order to get rid of uh, the Mullahs. It's easy for me to say, sitting in Los Angeles, I know that the bomb will not drop on my head. 
uh, to say, yeah, at, at any cost, by any means, get these people out, bomb, so two million people die, so what? These people, are, I, I, no, I can't say that. And then here, when people ask me to vote one way or the other, uh, you know, forgetting that America has uh, environmental issue, medical issue, race issue, um, social security issues, and dozens of issues on which when Americans go to poll and vote, they should keep it forefront in their mind. I'm not going to sacrifice all of that um, because some people are thinking, uh, no, I mean, you should only look at the next election through the lens of Iran, which I refuse to do. Okay, you've given me a treasure chest of talking points in that one answer that that I want to deconstruct and take one at a time. We'll get to the politics, uh, but first, a, a couple of statements. First of all, I'm on to you. I knew you were going to, I suspected you might use your egg analogy, uh, which I love, but I do want to say sometimes people still choose to separate the egg, even though it naturally mixes in the bowl. That still exists. To, to extend the metaphor perhaps further than you wish to. Um, and, and the other thing I was going to say is uh, I'm not sure if it matters. You know, you did the percentage on how long you've been here and how long you've been in Iran. To a certain extent, Peter John, I don't know if that actually even matters because I didn't spend my life first, first half of my life in Iran, but I still feel that duality and that incredible uh, identity and that devotion to two nations, in my case, Canada and, and, the, and Iran, even the UK, where I spent my early years. And, and I know cousins of mine or friends who've come very recently in the last two or three years or five years and feel that same devotion to, to their new country as, uh, as, as you do, having been here for a few decades. So it's almost not about the amount of time spent, but this preternatural, this, um, this, this bigger than geography feeling that you, we develop towards the, uh, a duality of cultures. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you, you you notice that I did not say I did not weigh my allegiances based on the number of years. I said ninety five percent adult life here right. and so forth. Right. So uh, no, I I think the loyalty and a sense of belonging that you have to do the two countries are not uh, weighed by number of years that you have spent in either places. Uh, no, I was born there. They're, when they're in my roots, my parents, my history, uh, uh, it's all rooted in Iran. Uh, whether I was there for 18 years or 1,800 years, uh, that's, that's there. So all I'm saying, it is unreasonable for people who have not experienced this duality to question your loyalty towards one versus the other. Right. It only the people who have lived this life, and they are deeply connected to uh, two cultures, they know what I'm talking about. They know the uh, sense of belonging and loyalty that they have towards both, uh, which is, uh, you know, I, I don't uh, ascribe an index to it. I mean, 60% here, 40% there, it, it's not that. I just give you a factual data and how much of my life has been, uh, you know, in the two countries. You. But America is where I got educated. It's where I got the opportunity to work, as you said, in one of the most American of American institutions. So it gave me all of that. I owe it. I owe it to that culture. I love that culture. And I love my home country, and I don't see any contradictions in those. Even within the loyalty, as you know, there's... There isn't always unity. And uh, I want to ask you about our global Iranian community. I know you've said you're uncomfortable, by the way, with any kind of hero worship. And again, you've demonstrated your modesty already in this interview. But, but you are one of the most prominent names and voices in our diaspora. And you've talked about seeing how other communities help each other and their home base, if you will. Jewish Americans say, helping out other Jews and Israel. Uh, and yet, uh, for all of our our wealth and education in the diaspora, the brain trust, as uh, you've called it at times, we, we don't always do that. How frustrated are you by that? And tell me about the delta between pride and collective support in our Iranian community. Yeah, so um, 
I, I think, in uh, unfortunately, uh, our uh, country, uh, home country, Iran, has been facing so many on top of uh, what they're suffering under the current regime. There are also, you know, there's been floods and there's been earthquakes, there's been pandemic. And uh, I have seen remarkable uh, coming up together of people trying to raise funds, uh, you, you know, for these causes, I've been involved in a number of them myself. And even in a more steady state, uh, I'm involved with organizations that try to educate young kids who are bright, but their parents want them to come and go on the street and sell trinkets to bring an additional income home, and therefore they take him out of school. And you go talk, tell the parents, uh, uh, you know, how much this nine-year-old girl brings home? They say, oh, $50. They say, okay, if we give you the $50, would you let her go back to school? You know, and they say yes. And so I'm part of an organization that does that, and there's several, many different organizations and many people who are involved. But also the enmity uh, that stands in uh, between U.S. and Iran doesn't make it easy. I mean, the banks don't transfer money. Right. Uh, you know, it's not easy to send money and, you know, engage in commerce. So within the limitation, unfortunately, and hostility that exists between the two countries, uh, there are people, uh, you, you know, who within the limitation try to, uh, you know, to help Iran. The unity that you talked about, which is lacking, uh, you know, it is... Uh, a vast majority, uh, I, I will hesitate to put a percentage on it, a vast majority of Iranians who live outside of Iran, um, I don't know, some estimates says 7, 8 million uh, people. Uh, in America, the estimate ranges between 1 to 2 million people. Uh, I know Toronto, for example, is, uh, you know, has a very large population of Iranian it's Americans. It's exploded here, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm, you know, don't uh, force me to bring proof. It's my sense that the majority do not like, do not approve of the current regime in Iran, and they want it gone. Not modified, but gone. Uh, and they want a, uh, a secular democracy in place of it. But, now back to your unity question, they cannot agree what form that secular democracy should take, and worse than that. And I face it all the time. It is not sufficient that you're against that regime. They want you to be against the, in, uh, that regime in a way that they are against that regime, to fall behind their line. So that is why 40 years has gone by and nothing has happened, because people cannot unify. I mean... Uh, you know, we say that the mullahs are uh, ignorant, and, and you know, I won't cite that notion, certainly. Hmm. But somebody like Khomeini was clever enough, uh, differentiate between being smart and being clever, right, right. clever enough to uh, unify people who, went, who were against the prior uh, monarchy and unite them for his purpose. Now, of course, uh, you know, he betrayed all of them later, but nonetheless was able to unify them. Uh, we lack leadership that's able to uh, unify. Right but why now. are we, sorry to cut you off, but why are we so prone to, you've called it before, the my way or the highway attitude. Why are we so prone to that in the, as a global community? Jen, I don't think it is unique to us. I mean, I look at the polarization in American society. Uh, you know, that is here as well. Uh, I don't know. But leaders can either try to unify or they can further divide people. And unfortunately, in the U.S. right now, we have leadership that tries to divide rather than unify. But going back to your a point about uh, Iranians. I think we need a charismatic leader that will try to overcome this tendency by the diaspora, certainly outside of Iran, 
I, I think people inside Iran in some way are more unified in, in a way that they want this regime gone by any means possible. But in Ameri- in uh, outside Iran, we're more engaged uh, trying to pick our favorite government after these guys are gone and willing to fight over that, forgetting about the fact that these guys are, haven't exactly <laughs> packed their suitcases right. ready to go. Uh, so the first job is try to, to uh, facilitate their departure. And uh, so I, I don't know. I think a, a, a charismatic leader could help uh, reason uh, with the different factions and try to unify them. But I just don't see it right now on the horizon. You've made an interesting decision in recent years. Um, I mean, while you were serving completely uh, at NASA uh, up until 2016, you you stayed quite clear of politics. Um, In in the last few years, you've become quite vocal in expressing, for example, uh, your dismay at the political situation in Iran uh, and in the United States with uh, Donald Trump as well. You've pulled no punches. Um, I want to get to the kind of reaction you've received from that. But first, tell me about that decision, because it feels like you would need to have known that this is uh, this is going to be a minefield to start opening up in terms of uh, being open about your political feelings. Tell me about making that decision. Yeah, Jean, the trigger point was a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, I was so engrossed uh, in my professional life, and the social media wasn't what it is today and that I sort of steered clear of politics uh, until 2009. 2009, when the Green Movement happened, and because of the social media, I saw how the young people uh, with nothing more than t shirts and a rock to protect them were getting massacred. Uh, you know, it just uh, awakened something in me. And I started uh, getting a lot of messages because now social media shrunk the world, so I was in contact with young people in Iran. Uh, Why don't you say anything? Why don't you take a position? And at that time, I heavily aligned myself with what uh, came to be known as the Green Movement without ever uh, mentioning uh, who were the Agaye Karubi, Agaye, who was the other guy, Musavi. Without ever mentioning, because my support was not for them. My support was for the fight of the Iranian people for democracy. So I aligned myself with the Green Movement. And that sort of started that 2009, so it's been sort of 11 years that got engaged in uh, political discourse. And then later, uh, you know, I did make what I look back right now, uh, in retrospect, uh, probably not the right thing to do is that uh, in the last election, uh, I was so intent, basically uh, through urging of uh, friends and family in Iran, that said if uh, Raisi becomes uh, president, our life would be even more miserable than it is today, that, uh, you know, he should not become president. And for me, it was very obvious, if you don't vote, basically, uh, you guarantee that he would become, because he was the uh, elected, selected candidate of the Rahbar, that he would become. So I urge people to vote. So I've gotten a lot of backlash on that one. You know, how could you be against the regime but still urging people to vote? Uh, because, uh, as we can see, Rouhani has proved yet again that there is no differ- differentiation between these Ahons. They're all the same. And uh, how can you have done that? Uh, And so once again, uh, I was, uh, you know, in favor of uh, people's lives not getting even worse than what it is today. But apparently it has made no difference. And that has sort of solidified my current position that this whole regime in its entirety, this whole apparatus in all factions, whether Eslah uh, Talab, whether it is uh, what, whatever they, they call the other, Usul Gara or whatever else, that the entire thing needs to be dismantled and replaced by a secular democracy. But uh, if you have time to talk about it, there is another thing, unfortunately, aside from our disunity, another thing which prevents us 
from finally waking up from this nightmare. And that is something which has been in our Iranian DNA for now, uh, you know, a couple of centuries, uh, not unique to current time. And that is that we believe unless somebody else wants it, some other force outside of Iran, be it, uh, and in different times it has changed, be it China, be it Russia, be it England, uh, or being America, unless they wish it, nothing will change in Iran. So we are always are looking for a savior, which never comes. And uh, so we really, if we are to wake up from this nightmare, we really need two things to happen. One is the unity that you talked about before, uh, all uh, pulling in the same direction. And the second thing is stop looking for this you know, it's the same thing as people uh, in Iran who have this imam, apparently, which is down at the bottom of a well, and they're waiting for him to come out and spread joy and peace around the world. It's the same thing. Uh, it's the same superstition that the religious people have when they are waiting for, whether it be Trump or be anybody else, to come and liberate Iran which will never happen. So without these two, to be believing in your own will and um, ability to make change and without uniting, uh, you know, they've been around for 40 years, they'll stay around another 40. Fears, tell me about the backlash and, and how it affects you. They, the uh, you know one thing that we do have trouble with in in our in our community in our diaspora and we've we've touched on it many many times on this show already um, is just sitting across from each other and, and talking even if we have profoundly different opinions about how the regime must change or how we, how that change should be prosecuted etc. It's a difficult. Banafsha Akhlaqi was uh, on this program a couple of weeks yeah. ago, and she said, yeah. "Look, the definition of democracy is just let's sit and actually talk to each other." But um, yeah. uh, for a number of reasons, some of which you've cited, there's it's uh, tensions are high, and people's opinions are that my way or the highway uh, position that does sometimes prevail. It prevails depending on which guest we have on per, uh, each week. We're we're labeled one show or, or another, sometimes completely yeah. contradicting yeah. each other. So. So you were this guy for many years, I can only assume, who was the the NASA guy that everybody in the global community, Iranian community, loved and adored. And then all of a sudden, as you start taking opinions, uh, political opinions, be they about Iran or be they about Donald Trump, etc., um, you start hearing from people. What what has that been like for you? Uh, so, Jian, first of all, you have to, uh, you know, you cannot um, step into the political arena without developing a thicker skin. I was deeply hurt, uh, right? Partially because of what you said, I was not used to. Uh, maybe I was spoiled by um, the love and respect that I had received, uh, many of which, by the way, was exaggerated and, and deserved, I'm sure. But, uh, but the assault and how vicious it was uh, caught me by uh, by surprise. And this labeling that you just that is the uh, the sickness right now in um, our diaspora. Uh, it is to uh, and by the way, uh, you know the social media is a two-edged sword. It, it allows a lot of opinions to be aired, but also, it allows very easily, without impunity, without uh, with impunity, to label people. Yep. Okay, so people come and you say, you know, Firuz and Adiri, uh, uh, a, uh, a stooge of uh, of the Jomhuri Islami, which just on the face of it <laughs> would sound stupid. Anyone who hasn't gone back to Iran for even when my mom passed away, I couldn't go back to Iran. And I've been warned that uh, all my communications is being monitored by Jomhuri Islami. And every fiber of my body is, uh, rebels against this regime. Uh, you know, but nonetheless, I mean, it doesn't cost anything. You just come and you say, uh, he is. He is a stooge of the Islamic Republic. 
or pick an institution that allegedly uh, is uh, uh, a storefront for them, uh, the uh, NIAC, uh, which uh, I don't have any independent way of uh, uh, knowing uh, whether they are or not, but uh, without any uh, proof, evidence, you know, you're engaged in NIAC, you are part of NIAC, you're on the board of NIAC, which I've never, ever been. You, you deny it maybe once or twice or three times, and then you uh, figure it's useless. You know, it's trying to stick your finger, you know, in a hole that's gushing water. You, you give up. But nonetheless, I still look across the three platforms where I am, Facebook, Instagram, and, and Twitter. The percentage of people who come and sling mud relative to other people who still, uh, you know, they say, stick with it, please be our voice, speak, you know, don't mind these people. It's, it's still a small percentage. It's, uh, you know, five or six percentage uh, of the people who come on my platforms, they, uh, you know, yeah, it hurts. It hurts, but, you know, you can't do anything about it, so you don't uh, dwell, and you just hope that rational people uh, would see that that is the case. And the thing with the social media is that you read something without trying to ascertain its validity, you repeat it. Hmm. And then somebody else repeated, repeats that. And so when I have confronted some people where I thought they were more educated, because the uneducated ones are very easy to uh, to spot. They right, always right. Uh, invoke body parts below, below their belt. <laughs> and uh, so you dismiss those as uh, they, they are in a gutter. Mm. But the people who appear to be more educated, you say, can you show me one evidence? What do you say? I mean, based on what do you say that? And so we go back and forth and back and forth, and it ends up saying, okay, I apologize. Except I don't want to spend that much time you know, confronting these people. So by and in large, I try to ignore it and say, you know, and state my opinion and not be bullied by these people right. because right. the more that you respond to them, in some way you elevate them and they're not worth it. But if it's been hurtful or difficult for you, it hasn't deterred you. You continue to, I think, eloquently put your opinions out there. And since we've talked about you doing so and the reaction to it, let me actually get to a couple of the opinions so that people have a sense of uh, what we might be talking about if they don't follow you on Instagram, for example. I want to read from a post of yours on Instagram, uh, which I thought was just so, uh, was very clear and and. Um, sensical, uh, discussing the crackdown, this is from a couple of months ago, discussing the crackdown on Black Lives Matters protesters in America and drawing the connection to the way protesters in Iran are treated. You say, and this is me quoting you, the protesters are quote-unquote low-life scums. What they are doing is quote-unquote crime against God and the police should respond with force and harshness to quote-unquote dominate them. Who said these? If you said Khamenei about the Aban protesters, you are right. And if you said Trump about the current protesters in America, you are right again. A corrupt autocrat is a corrupt autocrat in Iran or in America. If a guy doesn't care about human rights in his own country, as Trump certainly does not, how could he possibly care about human rights in Iran in a far distant land? It doesn't make any sense. You know, I mean, you first have to demonstrate that you value uh, human rights here in this, you know, in your own country, the, the one that you govern and you're a leader of, before you espouse, uh, you know, uh, human rights in uh, 20,000 miles away. Um, I mean, so I don't buy into uh, this thing that... Uh, I mean, all the people who are waiting for Trump to uh, save Iran, they will come to a sad realization one way or the other on November 3rd. Either way, 
either he is not elected or if he is elected they will find out another four years that all he really wants and all he has said i mean how many times does he have to say it you know i'm not after the regime change all the man wants is a photo op and a deal so he can say i got a better deal that obama did uh, so either way, they're going to be uh, 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 disappointed. So at the end, look within. Look to yourself. Look to your neighbor. Look to fellow opposition leaders. Unite with them. And stop looking at uh, these saviors uh, from foreign lands that will never come. I've asked you about Iran. Let me ask you quickly about America. I know you have no affection for Trump. We just heard that. But as a scientist in particular, are you concerned about a second Trump administration after November 3rd? Uh, yes. Uh, look, uh, I mean, the one which is very obvious is, of course, is his total disregard and his uh, administration's total disregard for global warming. It's hard to point to another topic where the community of global scientists uh, there's a unanimity about the consequence of what we, did, we are doing to Earth, right? Yet, he is unfazed, okay? And then look at his disastrous handling of the pandemic, uh, which basically at every turn, he opposes the, uh, the finding of the scientists and the opinion of scientists. Yeah. So someone so anti-science, uh, you know, naturally, I wouldn't like to see me uh, also get another four years shot at being the presidency uh, and doing the harm that he does to the environment and to the health care. You've been so generous with your time. Let me finish off with a couple of questions that are, are zoom out questions about what you see uh, and what you have felt that can come in the future this this program at its heart is about and we say conversations from to and about the iranian diaspora is about people of iranian descent of course it's for for more than just people of iranian descent but for those of us who are of iranian descent it matters what is happening in iran um we can't let go of that and as you've said in this interview it's been a particularly disastrous year dating back to the, the killing of protesters in the streets last year to the to the flight seven five two to covid uh it has just been horrendous fears in many interviews you have expressed your optimism and hope in the younger generations in iran today w where does that hope stem from i mean are you in touch with young people in iran what why do you feel so optimistic even though it is really uh, increasingly harder and harder uh to be but you know what i have said and i think it's it hardly can be argued that when we talk about the wealth of Iran, the assets of Iran, you know, often people talk about uh, the oil and gas energies, and, you know, we are number three, four, whatever it is that we are in the world, and other things, Ali, Pesce, Javier, what have you. These are not, you know, the real assets of Iran. The assets of Iran, uh, it's the, the young people. And that's the future. That's the, tr that's the treasure. And uh, ultimately, I think if, if something is going to happen, it's going to be because of them. Uh, I think older people are by nature conservative and stay home. And it is young people who are optimistic and idealistic and go and, in fact, um, sacrifice uh, the most valuable thing that they have, which is their life. So I'm optimistic because of Iran's youth. It is educated. It is in touch, uh, you know, because of uh, the uh, social media. And at the end, uh, if um, I hope that Iran will come out of this thing, um, my hope is, you know, it's the young people. Uh, it's not the wealthy person who sitting in Beverly Hills or sitting in Toronto or what have you, or, or uh, Vancouver with uh, ill-gotten wealth, and, uh, and they're not going to do anything. Uh, they took the loot and they run away. Uh, so it is the young people. Uh, that's, uh, if I have optimism, it's because of that. 
a final question. You've uh, you've talked about how your experience in space exploration tells you that a unifying principle uh, we can live by is that planet earth is home to all of us in other words whatever else divides us if we stand above and look back we all inhabit the earth as one it's it's incredibly simple and yet such a profound perspective that we seem to have so much trouble with on this planet what could we all learn from seeing things from the perspective of outer space you know normally i end my lectures with a um with one final slide uh, which is a side-to-side image of the map of the Middle East with all the borders and all the, uh, you know, havoc that's going on there. And the other one is the view of the astronauts when they look back at Earth and they see this beautiful, unified blue marble without any of those artificial lines that we have drawn on a map of the Earth. And we have found... Uh, languages and religions and cultures uh, uh, and race, uh, you know, to separate us from each other. Yet, when you look at it from the space, uh, Earth is home to all of these differences. And that's the only home that we have. So I think it it is, uh, you know, you were earlier asking about the benefit of space exploration. It is this realization of unity uh, which I think is another byproduct of the space exploration. And that's the way we ought to view of Earth, uh, view the Earth and view uh, uh, our place in it and not by artificially drawn lines or in geographical maps. Fidus Nazari, it's been uh, an, uh, an unquestionable uh, pleasure and an honor to to get to do this with you. Uh, the, I'm only sad that we couldn't do it in person in these uh, Corona days, but hopefully before too long we can do that as well. Thank you so much for doing this today. Hey, thank you, Gian. You're a very good interview and it was easy to talk to you. I hope to see you soon. Merci. Good office. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Award-winning scientist and NASA director, Dr. Firuz Nadiri, he joined us from Los Angeles. invigorating conversation with Fidus Nadari. I'm so uh, honored by how open he was, talking about how um, it was very difficult for him to be receiving the backlash he's received in recent um, years for some of his political opinions. Uh, um, it was unrevealing. I, I, I'm, I'm still processing it, and I really, really quite enjoyed that. Keon, 
He's fascinating. I mean, anybody that works in the in space or NASA, let alone, is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, thank I, you for that. I, analysis. I think I'm a little speechless. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> so, so Just think he's so no. <laughs> you really went there. That a lot of depth. <laughs> Yeah. And now Captain Reza. It's going to be, I could just yeah. feel, I mean, what do you have to say? Oh, he was it, interesting. It, it, Anyone who works in space. Answers. Impressive. Whoever is near a rocket is, <laughs> gets my vote. No, I, no, in all seriousness, he's, he's quite, he's amazing. And the fact that he's from Shiraz, Shirazi, I, oh. hey, I love that. That's right. He's that's, a Shirazi yeah, guy. Yeah, really that's good. right. And see, you know what I realized, oh, actually? Oh, oh. oh see, yeah, this something to right, say. Yeah, oh, there he is. <laughs> no, you know what's interesting? The fact that... You said he's from the si- uh, Iran city of poets. Yes. And then um, I remember like listening to the interview. I'm, I'm like, this guy, like, and you said that as well. You were like, you make things very accessible. You make the knowledge very, even though like you're not into space and um, uh, necessarily, and there's a lot of scientific terms that we don't necessarily understand, but he makes he simplifies them and re- and t- tells the stories in a very poetic way that makes you want to hear even more. Uh, you know what I mean? Absolutely. I his like his use of uh, metaphors and, yeah. and I mean the the speaking of the little specks of sand and then the sports analogies, the the the, the soccer ball. It was it, yeah. it it helped us visualize what he was talking about. And you know why he's such a great storyteller? Why uh, is that? Because he's from the city of poets. The poets of, of Shiraz. Shiraz. How come you didn't get that gene? <laughs> I did. I did. I <laughs> I lost it when I went uh, to Canada. Keon, when you walked in as the Bowie was playing, you yeah. walked in, you were like, that was amazing. I loved that. And I, then, and so what, what What was it that you liked so much? I about think that? I liked the way he ended it off. Uh, what was your question? You were, you said something about like. I was asking about what perspective you get from from space looking back at this uh, this planet. Because he, he, he speaks that, quite poetically he, about yeah, we're that, all on this, you know, we're just all this speck in the world of, of, of humans. Well, I, I was visualizing the earth from space at that point, And he said, you know, when you look at this mm. rock and you realize we're all on this rock. Rock and yeah. we're all in there together. Yes. So stop, you know, stop the the mess Division. that we're creating yeah. of it. Just why can't we all be together? And yes, yes. Think of it that way. So Groovy Shia. That was beautiful. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I, we were having a conversation. I thought <laughs> you might be listening <laughs> yeah. along. No, I, I yes. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry to disturb you. you. you Were you doing something else? <laughs> no, you want my uh, opinion. Yes, I'm what? asking you. Yes, since we're talking yeah, about yeah. the interview that I just did with Fears Not Here, I yes. thought maybe you might have something to, to say about it too, since you were sitting there with the dials along with Captain Reza. Yes. Um, I love that picture that uh, he uh, he pictured for us about the two different map one with border one without borders and we really have to understand that there is no border mm. Mm. it's just some yeah. artificial things that it's man-made yes yeah. man-made. all right well thank you for your comments on feeders nadiri it is thursday it's the time for letters of the week So this week on episode 34, we had a feature interview with Iranian-American actor Navid Nigahvan. He talked about his journey from living in a car when he first came to America to becoming one of the busiest actors in Hollywood today. He also talked about representation, roles, and the responsibility when it comes to portraying Middle Eastern characters on screen. He talked in depth on that, actually. Um, So a few people wrote in uh, to that interview. We have Instagram username Mark of Excellence wrote, Navid's comments changed and confirmed my sentiments on the Shah of Iran. And Gian, by walking a fine line, you are part of the connective tissue, the Chehel Tike. Thank you. Nice. Nice. Thank you, Mark of Excellence. And I I have to say, um, I I never realized that he played the Shah of Iran in a short movie. I think I I need to actually find that and watch it. Yeah, he's quite impressive in it. I mean, yeah, it's worth worth seeing. That's a heavy role to play. As he said, yeah. There's a a lot of responsibility to get it right. Doing the research on that, I can't imagine. And what people think is right is is, uh, the the source of a lot of debate. But uh, he's an interesting guy to take on all those different roles. I, I think I was pretty envious when he was talking about all the research he had to do and get in touch with his close friends and private interviews that, that that's so cool yeah. to research yeah. yeah i wish i wish it was public all that what did you think reza 
of Navid Nagaban. I yeah. thought he's a great guy and a very uh, prolific actor. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So we have a Azade Sharukhi. She wrote to us on YouTube. She said, I love, love, love all the interviews. Thanks, Gian and Rook Media. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Azadeh. I love, love, love you for saying that. <laughs> That's nice. We also have Ria Print on YouTube. She wrote, I love your music in the beginning. Thank you. That's nice. So we have a Nazila Rafizadeh on Facebook wrote, First, I should say hi to you, Gian, and all the round table members. Such a great choice in conversation. Navid Negahban has worked like an ambassador to truly introduce Iran and Iranian culture around the world. Unfortunately, I agree with him about our diffused community. So I have to say everything goes back to us because of us. Also, I don't know who was the mastermind behind the Rook program. It's a great idea having conversations with successful Iranian people, not in Farsi, but, but in English. So all of you are great ambassadors too. You are our voice. I love you. Keep going and I believe you will be successful as you are now. Very nice. a beautiful note. Very nice. As well, we have Agnes Liu on Facebook wrote, What's the name of the piano melody at the beginning of each session? <laughs> it's so beautiful and tranquil, as if saying, Hey folks, welcome on board. Very nice. Fasten your seatbelt and off we go. Gian's little song that Shia didn't like. <laughs> is what the name of it is. Take that, Shia. <laughs> Take that, Shia. <laughs> All right, as well. So last week on episode 33, we had an interview with the karate champion and head coach of the Canadian national karate team, Nassim Varaste. A lot of people wrote in uh, about that interview. We have a Ali Khalili on YouTube wrote, such an incredible interview. To me, it was amazing to see that despite all the sufferings she and her father went through after the rev revolution in Iran, her heart still beats for Iran. And she was open and passionate about coaching the national team in Iran. I strongly believe that the Iranian diaspora is a treasure of human capital for the country. One day soon, we will finally come into effect to make our country great again. Um, and then we have Alpine Ibex, username I Alpine Ibex, wrote, Voice comments is a good idea. Also, I really appreciate the music recommendations. Nice. That's true. That's some really good music in there. Um, we have Sobhan Nasiri wrote, Hi Gian, can you please add auto-generated subtitles to your videos? It's so easy and would help many people. Actually, we're, we're talking about doing that, right, Captain Reza? But, we, um, but by the way, if you are listening to this on YouTube or experiencing this on YouTube, you can just press the closed caption button and it will give you subtitles. But, I, but we're going to work on that so we have them for Instagram and other platforms. Hmm, it is a useful thing to do. Um, we have Robert Rahbar says, Thank you, Gian. This is a very unique platform, and I'm sure with your gift in media presence, this will become a big show. Voice of Diaspora. It's a vibrant feeling of urgency to be heard. Nice. Thank you, Robert. That's very lovely. And Shaya is laughing. You know why? Why? Because it's Rahbar. And oh this one I know. Did, did you get Robert right? Oh. Yes. <laughs> Robert, Robert Rahbar. You guys are killing me with these. <laughs> Rahbar. Robert Rahbar. Cool. Then we have a Sultan BC, username Sultan BC, wrote, Thank you again for a great show. Gian, you are the master of this trade. This lady reminded me of my old buddy in Iran getting beat up by a karate girl. Mm -hmm. I kept laughing at him because he deserved it too. <laughs> Lots of respect to Nassim. Just remember, taking that job in Iran has some risks and would put you in danger. They aren't good at keeping their uh, end of the bargain. Dual citizens like us have ended up in jail for politics upper hand before. Love you guys. So that this is a response to the, the at the end of the interview, Nassim said that uh, she's been getting some offers to coach in Iran and she's something she's considering. That's what people are reacting to here. Yeah. yeah. She's the, currently the head coach of the Canadian team. Mm-hmm. So, and then we have Instagram username Marzie. She wrote, I'm so addicted to the podcast that I can't focus on my own research work. Laughing emoji. Yay. Why isn't that the letter of the day? That's, I love well, that. Well, funny you should mention addicted. the letter of the oh, week. Oh, it's the it's letter of the week. Woo! Yeah. So we have Hamid, uh, last name S-H, on YouTube wrote, What a great interview. 
People like you, Jian, as well as Nassim and all of your other guests, are role models to many of us. It's such a beautiful thing to see fellow Iranians become national and international icons. Your program shines light on these great heroes whom have had their well-deserved spotlights taken away from them one way or another. Congratulations, Jian and team, on this amazing show. You should also at some point consider interviewing greats like Gugush, Farmars, Aslani, and Ebi. Hmm. We will do that. Never heard of those people. <laughs> <laughs> but <Gugush> thank you. <laughs> Is that the last name, Gugush, or the first name? <laughs> thank you, Hamid S.H. You have the letter of the week. Uh, thank you, the fabulous Keon. Thank you, uh, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. <laughs> you asked me a question while we were we were playing Bowie. That uh, I, I have to admit that I wasn't a fan of Bowie before. Oh. But uh, last week, as you may know, I started to uh, read your book, yes. 1982. <laughs> yes. And I think I I kind of got con. Contaminated with, <laughs> <laughs> with Bowie and you're a Bowie fan now. Yes, wow. yes. Contaminated. The book is doing its work. And, and by the way, your book is really uh, uh, I'm really you. into. Yeah, thank you very really much. Great. Thank you very much. I'm glad that 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 uh, it's brought you to David Bowie. Yeah. Hopefully, Talking Heads as well. You'll get to that. Where all, are you? All, all all the musicians that you mentioned, I I, I did you looked them up. Yes, yes. That's yes, great. Uh, yeah. That's that's a kind of encyclopedia for um, uh, these decades music. That's very kind. Mm. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you to Mo Rahimian and Insufin. Check out Insufin for financial planning needs and travel insurance. Thank you again to Mo and Insufin for all you do for the Iranian community and for uh, helping us out at Rook. Thanks to the amazing Rook team, Ponta, Reza, Shaya, Susan, Sarah, Merdad, Mohammed, Kian, and Roham, who's been helping us out. Uh, I want to go out on some music by a band called Bomrani. They are, I think they, they live in Tehran, right? Yes. They're still in Iran. Yes. Uh, and uh, they just put out a new album last week, but I want to play a song from their 2017 record called Leaving and Passing By. This is actually the title track from that record. Leaving and Passing By, Bomrani. Thank you so much for listening. Mizun Bashin. معنی دل بستن معنی پیوستن معنی دل کندن گسستن معنی خاطره من چه بر کسی گذاشته و در حافظش مانده معنی حافظه آرزی زبط نگهداری مطالب و بقایی معنی آرزه اتفاق پیش آمد مرزش معنی فاصله مسافت بین دو چیزی و دو کس تو خیلی دوری خیلی دوری تو خیلی دوری خیلی دور تو خیلی دوری خیلی دوری تو خیلی دوری خیلی دور معنی خستگی معنی کهنگی معنی دل تنگی بیهودگی معنی انتخاب این کشتن کسی از میان گذینه های موجود معنی التحاب مفروضه شده از زبان کشیدن استرام معنی استرام آیا جانی ناخوشه هم همراه با بیلره معنی اجتناب ساز و کار دفاعی که در آن فرد از آن چه یادآور موارد ناگوار باشد دوری میکنه تو خیلی دوری خیلی دوری تو خیلی دوری خیلی Baby, do you 
صدا معنی اشتباه معنی انقضا انتها معنی استم را گذشتن و رفتن پیوست تکرار گذشتن و رفتن پیوست تکرار گذشتن و رفتن پیوست تکرار گذشتن و رفتن